The Morning Show here on Arise News. The COVID-19 pandemic has been wrecking havoc on practically everything that sustains human existence. But the pandemic may have served to unleash the creative capacity also and self-preservatory instincts of man in several unique ways. Children in Lagos, Nigeria, are being made to fight back through creativity and artistic ingenuity, which they will then showcase to the world later in the year. Joining us to discuss this new approach for dealing with the new normal and the pandemic is Polly Alakija, moralist, educator, and children's book author. Good morning and welcome to the program, Polly. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much Jerry, for joining us. Well, quickly, I would like you to tell us about the Five Cowries Arts Education Initiative and why is arts education important? Uh, drawings, poetry, as a way of creative intervention in the face of COVID-19. Mm, goodness me, well, I would say arts education is important at all times, not just during this pandemic. Um, so in a nutshell, Five Carries Arts Education Initiative um, is an NGO that we have been running for two years formally, um, but it's a continuation of work I've been doing for many years in the arts and education space. And what we do normally is work with teachers and educators, um, building their creative capacity. We see it as complementary. What we're trying to do is embed creativity across the learning experience. So we're here to support the educational experience. We're very mindful of trying to develop the soft skills that our young people need in the 21st century. Um, soft skills being collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking, which are skills that are not necessarily developed in our youth if they follow the normal national curriculum. So we're here to complement, we're here to support and here to ensure when children and young people finish their education experience, they've got some of these soft skills. Um, along comes a pandemic, and of course we all need to change how we're working. Um, but actually for us it's been an incredible um, experience and an incredible opportunity to try and leapfrog the challenges we're up against. So even before the pandemic, um, some educators were starting to look ahead at the soft skills needed for the 22nd century. So even some educators before the pandemic were looking at the four C's being slightly different. The four C's of the 22nd century starting to look like community, connection, culture. So very different um, four C's. They're very much the words that people have started talking about during the pandemic. They need to focus back on the community. So positivity through creativity uh, at a time like this. And I imagine that when people are thinking of keeping their children engaged and educated uh, while the schools are locked, nobody, nobody really thinks about art. It takes the back seat. So how have you been able to engage them? And how can we engage them to be more creative? Um, unfortunately, art tends to take the back seat most of the time. <laughs> it's, just, it's not just now. Um, but it's also because art is this weird, fluffy thing, isn't it, that some people are somewhat intimidated by. So what is art? Um, so some people think, no, I'm not creative, I'm not artistic, so it's not for me. But actually, it's not. Like I said, it's about those soft skills. We all want to communicate, we all want to collaborate, we all want to ask questions and find our own voice. Um, so um, what we've done during this pandemic has been a, an incredible um, opportunity, as I said, for us to really focus on what we need to be investing our energies in, into. Um, and yeah, of course, the, the number one question that was always thrown at us is, OK, our children are now in lockdown. They're, they're in their homes. How do we reach those children? Um, a lot of educational NGOs and programs have been focusing on online learning, but the reality is that at least 90% of Nigeria's children are actually not online. Um, and even if they were, is that really a substitute for the real cognitive learning experience that is so essential, especially during those formative years? So we're strong believers in hands-on, on the real, on the practical. So what we've been doing is um, creating the resources that have been so lacking, um, so even before the lockdown, when we've been training teachers, so much of the content we're working with, the resources we're working with, are resources that are coming from the West, from Europe and the US. And so this has been an opportunity for us to say, OK, let's invest our energies in creating Nigeria-centric um, teaching resources, learning resources um, for our children and our youth. So we have um, one particular project that we've been rolling out for the last few years called My Story of Water. 
So, of course, that speaks directly to the COVID space. Um, my story of water is a story of sanitation, health, hygiene, and personal protection. So we've been able to unpack that, create um, learning resources that we've now developed into home learning kits. So over the last few months, we've developed a series of eight home learning kits. And those home learning kits are now printing out and distributing to children. We've got awesome delivery partners. We've got incredibly committed community leaders, teachers living in the communities, amazing courier company who helps literally get these physical worksheets to the children. One thing that's been really interesting, and be mindful of the four C's I've been talking about of the 22nd century, is that we had assumed that these home learning kits, these worksheets, would um, translate into one worksheet per child. But actually what's happened is the worksheet has become um, an activity sheet for the whole family to get involved in. So we've even had community educators asking, is, is it all right if the parents get involved? Is it all right if the neighbors get involved? So, which of course is absolutely awesome. So we've really seen these worksheets, these creative activities have really been a way of bringing in the whole family and the whole community into the creative experience. All right, uh, it's a pleasure having you, Polly. Uh, I, I just wanted to you know, talk about putting the message of COVID-19 out there with us. I mean, you did something very inspiring at, at, at the Fallamore Bridge. Uh, you did the mural there for the Bring Back Our, Child, Our Girls theme, and you went ahead to put face masks, <laughs> you know, on all the murals, passing messages of, you know, uh, protection during this COVID-19. I mean, how can we, we have bold messages like this, you know, in the hearts of people um, um, and create societal change, you know, in tandem with what the UN is saying with, you know, uh, sustainable development goals and, and things like that? Um, I thought you might bring up Falamore. Um, <laughs> the face masks on the columns of Falamore, yeah. Um, we've had two different versions of the face masks. Um, the first one was, yeah, an immediate response to trying to reinforce the Mask Up Lagos campaign. Um, very aware that we need to keep reinforcing that messaging. But what we did was just make these face masks and print the word protect on the first face mask. Um, so, of course, that protect can be read in many different ways. Who's saying protect? Protect who and how? Um, we need to be mindful of protecting our girls and our women um, at all times, not just, not just during COVID. Um, and then what happened with those face masks? The first set of face masks um, were white, and we printed protect in red on the white background, and they got really dirty. And the pollution there, the air pollution in Fallon was quite bad, so it wasn't actually possible to clean the dirt off the face mask. And I was wondering, OK, what is this? We can't take the face mask off these columns, because then that looks like a message that, no, now we need to take our masks off, so we don't need to protect anymore. We need to keep reinforcing that message. Um, so then I was wondering, you know, what is, the, what is the next message we need to put out there? Um, and so I just realized, yeah, um, it kind of coincided with the Black Lives Matter movement. And so we decided to print My Life Matters on a black mask and put them on those columns. Um, of course, it's a little bit ironic that we're putting those masks on the faces of these very voiceless women. Well, uh, Polly, you said that the arts education initiative is to complement what exists formally within the school system. And I would like to know um, what level of support do you get from government? And if not, or yes, uh, do you have partners who are also uh, supporting you to keep this uh, going? And are there specific challenges you faced uh, in the face of uh, uh, COVID-19? Uh, because I recall that in May, uh, you had uh, a competition. Uh, how did that work out, considering the fact that uh, uh, we are more or less in a state of transition because of COVID-19. Goodness. In terms of support and partnerships, um, our Commissioner for Education in Lagos State, Bola Shade Adifasayo, is fantastically supportive of the work that we do. And in fact, it was the Honourable Commissioner for Education in Lagos State who actually threw the challenge at Five Carries um, when schools looked like they were locking down um, because we were about to roll out a program across Lagos State called a studio and a school concept. And so she said, well, so now what do we do? And so it's actually the Honourable Commissioner who kind of put the challenge to us. 
So I'm really appreciative appreciative of her for, for doing that. Um, so we're working with some communities in Lagos State. We also have brilliant delivery partners. Um, so we work very closely with a fantastic organization called Teach for Nigeria. And we've been working with their teaching fellows very closely in Kaduna State, Ogun State, and Lagos State. Um, so they are in the community. So they are our go-to people in those communities. We're also working closely with SOS Villages Nigeria, and we're working with their communities in Abuja, Ogun State, and Lagos State. Um, of course, we always need more funds. Um, the issue with um, printing real physical worksheets is that needs real physical cash to make that happen. Um, so we do have some fantastic partners, sponsors that have enabled us to reach, we're now currently reaching over 4,700 families every two weeks, um, thanks to our fantastic sponsors. But of course, we're always looking to um, broaden our reach. Um, and we're actually now developing a program that's really focusing on community-led education. So it's a bit too early to talk about where we're going with that, but I'm hopeful that that's going to see us um, roll out what we're doing in several states in the north of Nigeria in particular. And these programs are only possible with the sign-offs from state governments. You, you have got to work with state governments. So generally, um, the doors do get open to us, and it doesn't take long, really, to get support. Um, what we're also looking at doing in Lagos State, which is a new development, which I'm very excited about, is to work with our youth corpus and engage with our youth corpus and get them to be more active in the community, supporting creative educational programs. Now, from the inception of the pandemic, if you look across the globe, including Nigeria here, uh, we haven't sort of prioritized children so much uh, for several reasons. Even if you look at the race for the vaccine, nobody's really talking about vaccines for children. Um, but I wonder what the pandemic means to a Nigerian child that is expressing um, himself or herself through art. What have you been able to get? What does this pandemic mean to them? And then I would like to know, you talked about the home learning kits, which you've designed, you said eight of them. Um, how can people or parents, you know, get a hold of these kits? Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm so glad you um, pointed out that it can perhaps look like the child has been forgotten in the COVID story. As if that's not just only in Nigeria, this kind of globally is like, my goodness me, what is the experience of the child through this whole process? Um, they're kind of locked up at home, they can't play with their friends, and so much about the child development is the experience of interacting with your friends and your peers. Um, so much of the learning experience is a result of self-motivation, and the best motivator is impressing your peers, and now all of a sudden you have to exist in this little bubble. Um, so very few people have thought about protecting the child, and even when we did one of our competitions that was referenced earlier, which was designing a face mask, we suddenly realized nobody's producing face masks for children. Everybody's producing face masks for adults. You put them on a child and it like wraps around the whole head. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, what has that experience been like for the child, which is why we're so um, um, passionate about getting these home learning kits into families um, to keep them inspired. Um, and I have to say, you know, most of our households that we're accessing have got quite a few children in them. So there's some level of peer interaction within the household. Um, and we just need to keep stressing kids, like try and keep it within your social bubble. Um, now, in terms of, yes, getting the materials out there, we've created these eight worksheets. They're very much a work in progress. We work very closely with all our um, community liaison um, officers and our um, teachers in the communities. So we send these worksheets out every two weeks, and we have a continuous feedback from them. So we're always refining, adapting what we're doing. Um, at the moment, the worksheets are rather aimed at the age group between 9 and 16. But actually, the reality is we've had kids as young as three, four involved, and it's been involving the whole family. So we've had grandmas and grandpas also involved. So we seem to have covered a fairly broad age range, but now we're going back to the beginning, reviewing, re-editing, reaching out to other artists, other arts educators to help develop the, the content so that we can develop a much broader offering to respond to the needs of not just the different ages, but also the different communities. Because, of course, the COVID response in the north of the country would be very different to the COVID response and the, the measures you need to be mindful of in a large urban city like Lagos. 
What we are now doing um, is, at the beginning of this whole process, of course, the buzzword was online learning. Everybody's giving out tablets and um, smartphones all over the place. But as I said earlier, most of our children are not online. And the communities we're certainly passionate about, passionate about engaging with don't has, have access to data. So most of the time, we've been kind of holding back and resisting the sort of whole digital narrative. But now that we've gone thus far in the development of our resources and in response to the demand for the resources. We've had interest from South Africa, Kenya, um, Republic of Benin, um, from Kigali. We've had interest, Kenya as well is interested in getting involved. So we've had interest from across the continent, but not only in the continent, also schools in London have been interested, schools in New York, um, schools overseas with a, um, a large number of children from the diaspora want access to these mater materials. We've even had a refugee camp in Greece reach out to us, We've got a large proportion of young people speaking Arabic from the continent. So they want the materials translated into Ar Arabic and made um, accessible to them. So we are now going to develop a digital platform and we're really grateful for the German government who's giving us funding to help develop that platform. So that's our next mission. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. So at the moment, yep, it's all systems go to develop My Story of Water, get it online, get it digital, open up the doors to other educators, get it translated into the main languages used across the continent. Um, so, yeah, we are looking and we're hoping that by the end of this year um, the materials will be translated into at least five or six main languages spoken on the continent and accessible to hopefully about 18 to 20 countries across the continent. All right, there's quite a lot of work, Polia. Really proud of you. We're really excited about this. But I just want to ask, uh, is, is this something that volunteers can still come in for if they want to be part of, maybe in the translation, even in the setting up of, of the digital platform and the likes? Awesome. Good goodness. Yes, please. There's a role for everybody who's passionate and excited about educating and supporting our children in so many different ways. Absolutely. Translation services. We so need you. Um, there's a strong de demand for translating into Arabic, Kanuri, Hausa, Pidgin, the Pidgin of um, the Niger Delta. We need worry pigeon. <laughs> we need worry pigeon. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many roles that we need filling, and um, it's all hands on deck in a very small way, but a very big way as well. Um, a really um, big um, help that we could do with um, is resources, um, images. All the worksheets, everything we're putting out there is very visual. We have to tell a visual story because we have a lot of um, parents involved in the process now that don't read and write. So we need to keep it as visual as possible. Um, and the children love poring over all the images that we're reproducing in the worksheets. Some children just literally look at the images and they're drawing, copying these images and getting inspired that way. The images are so very important. So we um, have to be mindful of intellectual property. So like getting the permissions to use those images, reaching out to artists to allow us to use the images. That's quite a big process, and I would love to put a call out to art collectors, people who, um, artists who have work that they feel might be relevant to the, the materials we're giving out, to say, hey, Five Carries, this is my work. Please do reproduce images. Acknowledge me in this way. It's a, it's a huge box that needs ticking, um, so I'd really appreciate help in that way. But um, quite apart from that, yes, translation, also, when things start opening up a bit, um, and as I say, we're expanding a lot more into the north, this whole community um, learning approach, there's going to be a lot of room for volunteers to roll up their sleeves and get involved. Well, one, we are promoting uh, art education for children. Uh, I also see that uh, you write uh, stories for children. Uh, so far, you have uh, is talking the uh, Baobab tree. Uh, counting chickens and then uh, catch that goat. Uh, is there any special reason for your fascination uh, with children? And then would you like to, uh, I've not been privileged to, to read uh, those children's uh, uh, books that you have written. Uh, would you also like to uh, talk about those three uh, publications? 
It feels a little bit like another life, those children's books. Those three titles were written quite some time ago. Um, I have to say, I don't have much time these days for writing stories for children. Um, my writing focus now is very much writing the resources and trying to get the narratives right for the resources. Um, but I do look forward to getting back to the storyboard and getting those stories together. And absolutely, with the stories that the children are putting out there, I've got so much material to work with. So you talk about a stalk and a baobab tree. If you look at what the children are like sending back to us, we're gonna have so much more fun than just a stalk and a baobab tree. Um, my passion for children, oh, it's just a delight and it's always an absolute pleasure to work with children and it's so easy to get it right and to inspire and to make impact. Um, and it's so horribly easy to get it wrong as well. Um, so it's an absolute privilege always to work with children and knowing that you can in one day, within an hour, within 10 minutes, if you say the right thing, show them the right approach, you can open their eyes and you can make an impact on their lives in a very easy, simple, joyful way. So it's um, a very selfish, um, selfishly driven motivation, I guess. I get huge satisfaction from working with children and knowing that you can really make such an impact, not only on their lives, but in the lives of their family, in the lives of their community. So it's a real honor to work with our children. I'd just like you to explain to us the part of the initiative where the children um, hopefully will showcase their works around the state and plans to also uh, showcase it in the international scene uh, next year. Are those plans still in place? Always. We showcase all the time. Um, we're big on showcasing. Um, sometimes, you know, people say, is it really necessary to go to all these lengths to showcase? Um, we have to measure our showcasing um, because it's very easy to get completely carried away with it. We have to be mindful that our main focus is, is reaching that child and developing that child. Um, we all want a gig, we all want a lot of fun, we all want a lot of excitement, so we measure our showcasing. But it's something we've, I've done, we've done as a team from the beginning, from inception. What does it do for that child? What does it do for that educator? It so is awesome for their self-esteem. There's not one child we work with now or one teacher who doesn't get excited about the fact that this work we're doing is going to be seen by a broad audience. Your voice is going to be heard. Um, so, it, yes, it's a cherry on the cake. But it's, my goodness me, it's such a fantastic way to motivate everybody. Um, the first time I took the work of our children of Lagos State to London was, gosh, four or five years ago. And we were given an awesome opportunity to put an installation outside the Tate Modern um, in London on the South Bank. And we had about two million physical visitors to that site. And we kind of shot ourselves in the foot a bit because, of course, this was such a big hit with all the kids and the teachers that they then said the next year, so now where is our work going to be shown? And I thought, oh, God, how, gosh, how do I better that opportunity? But I have to say, we work with amazing organizations in London, cultural organizations in London, and the mayor of London's cultural team, who are very supportive. And so we have a, a, a window in London for the work that we do. And so so, yeah, we can promise our children on, almost on an annual basis to show their work in London. Sadly, not this year because we, everything was just too uncertain. But the showcasing London is ongoing. This year, we were also supposed to be showcasing in New York and Paris. Um, but, of course, that's all shelved. Um, we showcase continuously in Lagos State. Um, we have a fantastic partner in Laswa. Um, Laswa is brilliantly supportive and of course with my story of water it kind of fits in really nicely with right. the need to improve, um, improve water transportation and our relationship with water in the state generally. So we showcase at the moment we have an installation both at the Laswa ferry terminal in Falamore, the five carriers terminal aptly named for us <laughs> and also the Ikorodu ferry terminal. So if you go to those wow. two ferry terminals you'll see the work of children. Wow. It's a bit dusty. We were supposed to have updated those uh, displays mid-year. Um, so, yeah. So we, on, we keep going with our displays. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, really exciting story, and we wish you all the best.